We're about to hear from Sarah Kloss, the head of care coordination at Shriners Children's Hospital. Sarah has been working with disabled divers for a number of years, and she's going to talk to us about many aspects of spinal injuries and other maladies that affect divers, and how you can work with them, and how you can overcome some of the challenges that they face and you face when going on a dive trip. Hi, I'm Sarah Kloss. I'm the Director of Care Coordination at Shriners Hospital for Children in Chicago and a volunteer for the Dive Heart Foundation. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about different types of disabilities. But first I'd like to talk about spinal cord injury and how spinal cord injuries affect about 10,000 people every year. Um, I work here at Shriners Hospital as the Director of the Spinal Cord Injury Program and work with a lot of kids who have spinal cord injuries. And those spinal cord injuries can be from car accidents, diving accidents, sport-related injuries, violence-related injuries, such as gunshot wounds. We also see kids who are affected by viruses, like transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre, very similar to what you also see in the adult population. So we see a lot of patients here at our facility who sustain spinal cord injuries from a variety of different manners. And what I want to talk to you about today is how spinal cord injury as a physical disability affects kids and adults who sustain injuries. One of the things that many of us need to know is a spinal cord injury can affect anyone. About one person every hour is newly injured with a spinal cord injury, which is about 10,000 new injuries per year. What happens with a spinal cord injury is a person actually injures a part of their cord. Sometimes we hear folks talk about the fact that they've broken their back. And a broken back where someone injures a vertebrae or the bony part of your spine is very different than a spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injury is where someone actually damages the interior cord that's protected by all of that bone. I'm going to show you a little bit today with one of our spines where injuries can occur and what they mean for people. Spinal cord injury means that you have some sort of loss of sensation or feeling and also loss of movement, what we call volitional movement, so voluntary movement. In addition to the loss of sensation and movement, people who sustain spinal cord injuries also struggle with issues like urinary tract infections because of neurogenic bowel and bladders, which we'll talk about in a little bit, complications from something called autonomic dysreflexia, and a variety of issues that are secondary medical complications, such as pressure ulcers, which can be very difficult to deal with and in some cases can be deadly. Spinal cord injury can be managed extremely well, and the point of rehabilitation is to make sure that somebody who sustains a spinal cord injury is able to do everything that they could do before they were hurt. And so our goal in our rehabilitation program is to get our kids to be as independent as possible when they are ready to leave our hospital. And for us, part of that also includes scuba diving. This is a model of a spine. And what you see here is it begins with the pelvic region, and you see the spinal column all the way up to what's the base of the skull, the cervical area of a spinal cord. And inside is where the cord actually exists. These are the bony prominences or bony areas that protect our spinal cord and the individual vertebrae. And inside here is the cord, and that's what sustains damage when somebody has a spinal cord injury. Now, depending on where on this spinal cord your damage is also depends on what your level of disability is. The higher level someone's injury, the higher their disability. For example, if someone sustains an injury at C5, which is the cervical region, fifth vertebrae down, they would have lack of sensation and movement from about the nipple line down. However, if you sustained an injury at the lower level of the spine in an area called the thoracic region, more along T12, the thoracic region, 12th vertebrae down, your level of sensation and movement would be affected from about the belly button down. So each spinal cord injury is actually different, although they are very similar as to how they present for physical disability. It's very dependent on where you're injured on your cord, how much function you do or don't have. For people who have higher level injuries, they're known as quadriplegics or tetraplegics. Those are interchangeable words. If someone is a quadriplegic, they have involvement of all four extremities, meaning both arms, both legs. They would have lack of sensation and lack of volitional movement in all of those areas. And depending on how high their cervical level injury is also depends on whether or not they're able to breathe on their own or they need ventilatory or respiratory support. For someone who has a lower level injury in the thoracic region, they would have more movement in their arms 
and they would struggle and be a paraplegic with less movement or no movement in their legs. And so again, it's totally dependent on where the cord is injured, either by the, the traumatic injury that occurs or the virus that may attack the spinal cord injury, as in cases of transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre. So level of injury is something that's very important and important for people to understand when they're working with somebody with a disability. It tells us how independent someone can be and how much additional assistance they may need. For diving, it's particularly important because if we're working with someone who has paraplegia and they're able to be completely independent in a variety of areas, they'll lead, need less help from their dive buddy. So we want to make sure that you understand someone's level of injury. If it's someone who has quadriplegia, higher level of injury, has less hand function or impeded hand function, then they would need more assistance and you'd need to talk to them at greater depth about exactly what sort of assistance they would need for diving. That gives us a little bit of a basic overview about spinal cord injury, where the cord itself is, and how level of injury is important. We also talk in rehabilitation about completeness of injury. If someone has a complete spinal cord injury, it does not mean that their cord is completely severed. That's actually very rare. A complete injury means that they have no sensation and no movement below their particular level of injury. If someone has an incomplete injury, they're still spinal cord injured, but they may have some movement or some amount of sensation that wouldn't be anticipated in someone with a complete injury. So those are in information pieces and things that are helpful when you're working with somebody with a spinal cord injury to know about them. Most people who sustain spinal cord injuries, including children that we work with, are able to tell you their level of injury and whether or not their injury is complete or incomplete and also how that affects them and what that means in their daily life. The next thing I'd like to talk about is a little bit more about some of the issues that come with spinal cord injury that oftentimes people don't think about. When someone sustains a spinal cord injury, other people may just think about the, par the paralysis, which leads to the need for a wheelchair for mobility. However, there are a variety of other issues that come into play when someone has a spinal cord injury because the spine has so many other functions. It works very much like a telephone line and it communicates information to and from our brain. One of the areas it controls is also our bladder and our bowel. So one of the things that many people don't know are folks that sustain spinal cord injury usually have what we call neurogenic bowel and bladder. For you and I, as I sit here now, if I drink a cup of coffee, my bladder is a muscle and it'll start to fill up. And every time we drink, a little bit more goes in there and our bladder muscle expands and expands and expands. And then what happens is, is we start to feel a little pressure. We think, hmm, maybe five more minutes into this meeting and now I better go to the bathroom. And we go to the bathroom, urinate, and our bladder comes back, sort of like a balloon. What happens when somebody has a spinal cord injury is their bladder doesn't have that same capacity to send the messages to the brain in the same way. So your bladder with a spinal cord injury is a muscle, it is like a balloon, it can expand and contract, but the message doesn't travel up the spinal cord injury to tell your brain when to do that. And that's basically what a neurogenic bladder looks like. So people with spinal cord injuries, and in our case, with, particularly with children and adolescents, do something called intermittent catheterization. Many people may have heard or seen leg bags where someone puts in what's called a Foley catheter and urine drains regularly into a leg bag. That is not the norm in spinal cord injury rehabilitation care anymore. The norm and the gold standard is something called intermittent catheterization where we would use a small tube, non-latex, and we'll talk about why in a moment, non-latex tube that's inserted through the urethra and allows urine to drain out. The important part about this is that somebody who has a spinal cord injury can imitate, their bladder can imitate, the same way to empty urine that you or I or someone else who is able-bodied would be able to do. This is important because it keeps your bladder, again, which is a muscle, in healthy shape. And it allows it to function very much like anyone else's would. So most people who have spinal cord injuries are on intermittent catheterization programs and usually catheterize on a timed schedule mostly every four hours and for some people they can go about every six hours. This is also important to know when you're working with somebody who has a spinal cord injury because they're not going to be able to feel if they have to urinate like you would. So it's important to know what the cathing schedule is, whether or not they're independent in catheterization, and how you can be of assistance in making sure that the person you're working with has everything they need, including things like an accessible bathroom, to be able to catheterize and take care of those needs. 
Neurogenic bowels are very similar to the bladder in that the message for elimination does not go from the spinal cord to the brain. The bowel can be trained and oftentimes what we do in rehabilitation is start the training very early on. We teach people how to do what we call a bowel program. Normally these are started every night until the individual who is a new injury is comfortable and eliminating all of their bowels appropriately and then we go to every other night. A bowel program is done on a consistent basis, usually upright on a toilet or a commode with digital stimulation and some assistance from additional medications and suppositories. The important piece of this to know is that people who have spinal cord injuries in most cases do not have full control over their bowels but have trained their bowels to work in a very specific way. Therefore, they often need to be on a bit more of a regimented schedule for their bowel program. One of the other issues I'd like to talk about about spinal cord injury is something called autonomic dysreflexia. It's a very long term that someone who sustains a spinal cord injury at the level of T6 or higher can be susceptible to. It's in particularly important for people to understand because the symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia, if not taken care of, can be life-threatening. Dysreflexia is basically a noxious stimulus, so something that's irritating, below the level of injury. So for people who sustain spinal cord injuries at T6 or higher, some, some sort of stimulus is irritating them below their level of injury that starts to cause some reaction in their body. So the best example I can give you for autonomic dysreflexia and the concept of a noxious stimulus or an irritating stimulus is if I took a hat pin, something very sharp, and stuck it into your big toe. What would likely happen is I'd get a kick. And the reason for that is, is you'd feel pain with your pain receptors. They'd send messages via your nerves up your spinal cord to your brain. Your brain would register that I had just stuck a pin into your foot and would send a message right back down to tell your foot to give me a good hard kick. Now, if you have a spinal cord injury, your spinal cord is not able to function in that same manner. Your body, however, does react to the fact that there's an irritating stimulus. Somebody stuck a pin in your foot. So, the spine is an absolutely amazing thing and the cord will send some sort of message to the brain. But it comes back jumbled. Instead of getting a very clear message from the brain back down to that foot to kick somebody, it gets all jumbled up and your body reacts differently. So what happens then with dysreflexia is the kinds of symptoms you would see are a rash, often across the chest area and upper arms, looks sort of reddish, kind of goosebumpy-ish. Oftentimes people will spike and have a high blood pressure. They'll feel sweaty, dizzy. And for each individual, those symptoms can be a combination of one or two or three or a little bit different. So it's important to know what your particular symptoms are if you're someone who is susceptible to dysreflexia. Basically, it's your body's way of saying there's something irritating going on. I don't know what it is, but this is the reaction I'm having to it. Now the interesting thing about dysreflexia is it's usually not a pin that's been stuck into someone's foot. 99% of the time, the response that your body is having is related to your bladder. So when someone with a T6 or higher spinal cord injury ends up having symptoms of dysreflexia, the very first thing we check is whether or not their bladder is full. 99% of the time that is the case, and as soon as they catheterize with that little intermittent catheterization tube that they'll use, all of the symptoms will go away. It's how you know it's dysreflexia. The symptoms immediately disappear when the noxious stimulus is removed. If for any reason it's not the bladder that's causing those symptoms, the next level of movement that we do is to do a bowel program to make sure that the person doesn't need to evacuate bowel or has some sort of problems with their bowel. And of course we also look at things like any clothing too tight, shoes on too tight, anything else that could be creating some sort of irritating stimulus. The reason it's so important to know a little bit about dysreflexia is because when these signs or symptoms present, if they're not taken care of and are allowed to continue, they can cause very serious medical consequences, including stroke and death. Another area of spinal cord injury that's important to talk about is the issues that come with lack of sensation. When someone sustains a spinal cord injury, they have lack of sensation from their level of injury down. For people who have complete spinal cord injuries, they have no sensation at all below their level of injury. For people who have incomplete level of injuries, they may have minimal sensation, light touch, pinprick. It's different in different circumstances. 
The important piece to understand about lack of sensation is that this puts people with spinal cord injuries at risk. If you and I were to go to the movies together, we would sit watching a movie and without even giving it a thought, we'd start to shift in our seats. We'd move a little like this, a little like this, cross our legs a different way. If you have a spinal cord injury, your body is not able to do that on its own and your brain isn't sending those messages that say, hmm, I need to move around a little bit. We unconsciously do that with our brain sending messages to our body that we're uncomfortable all the time, at the movies, in meetings, anytime, anywhere, driving in the car. With spinal cord injury, that doesn't happen. And so it puts people at great risk for something called pressure ulcers, which have also been known as pressure sores, decubitus ulcers, and bed sores. What this means is that, particularly when you have lack of sensation, the blood does not flow to an area as well as it should if you don't do pressure reliefs. So for people who have spinal cord injuries, they need to make a conscious effort to move their bodies on a regular basis. In our rehabilitation program, when we're teaching children and adolescents how to do pressure reliefs, we require them to do pressure reliefs every 15 minutes for 20 seconds. And a pressure relief for someone who's a paraplegic looks something like this. If they're sitting in their wheelchair, they'll put hands on either side of that manual wheelchair and lift themselves up, taking pressure off their bottom region and allowing blood to flow in that area every 15 minutes for 20 seconds. It's not easy to teach kids to do that, so we also use something called an Ironman Marathon Watch, which beeps every 15 minutes for about 20 seconds as a friendly reminder. Now, if someone has a higher level injury and doesn't have the arm function to be able to do those pressure reliefs independently, they may have a variety of other options. Instead of pushing straight up, as just shown, they may be able to just lean forward in their chair far enough that they would be able to get some pressure or go side to side. Either of those are options that would work for someone who has a lower level cervical injury. If, however, the person has a higher level spinal cord injury and uses a power wheelchair for mobility, most often their pressure releases are done in their wheelchair where they manually recline. So sitting at 90 degrees, which is straight up, they'd recline the back of their chair. In some cases, the power wheelchair actually reclines in space. It's called a tilt in space, where both the bottom seat and the back together. In other cases, the wheelchair back just goes down. But again, you do that about every 15 minutes for 20 seconds, which usually gives adequate pressure relief. Those things are incredibly important to remember so that people with spinal cord injuries don't continue to have secondary complications that make issues of disability even more difficult. In addition, when there's lack of sensation, one of the important things to remember when working with somebody with a spinal cord injury is that they can't feel areas of their body the same way that you may. So when putting on things like scuba boots, you want to make sure that all of their toes are even as yours would be. If you put on a scuba boot and your toes are crunched in, it's not the right size, you're going to actually feel that and know you either need to try a different size or rearrange your boot. The important thing with somebody with a spinal cord injury is that you're checking those things as you're working with your buddy or making sure if they have the ability that they're checking those things themselves. Other areas that are important in relationship to lack of sensation are also related to things like sunburn, heat, and cold. In the case of sunburn, someone who has a spinal cord injury could be out in the boat getting ready to do some diving and not realize that their thighs may be burning from the sun and so it's particularly important that we're careful with all of those areas that in rehabilitation we say are insensate or have no sensation. Another area of spinal cord injury I'd like to talk about is in relationship to temperature regulation. This is often an area people don't think much about when they're thinking about the spinal cord injury as a disability. But people with spinal cord injuries have a difficult time regulating temperature. If you or I were to go out on a really hot 90 degree day our bodies would naturally start sweating in order to cool us off. In the same breath, if we ended up going out on a very, very, very cold day, our bodies would shiver to try and warm us up. People with spinal cord injuries don't have that exact same ability after their injury, and therefore regulating body temperature can be very difficult. For each person, it's a little bit different, but oftentimes people with spinal cord injuries overheat much easier than someone who is able-bodied. 
That's particularly important again in diving as we're often out in the sun in hot weather and we need to make sure that we're keeping everyone well hydrated, out of the sun when at all possible and in a shady area and making sure that everyone stays cool, particularly those people who have spinal cord injuries and can't regulate their bodies on their own. So let's talk about one of the areas of spinal cord injury that many of us think about and that's mobility impairment. I think we all know when someone sustains a spinal cord injury that their mobility becomes impaired. They're not able to ambulate the way that they used to prior to their injury. And so most people with spinal cord injuries use wheelchairs as their way to get around in their mobility in the world. Now it is important to know some people with spinal cord injuries, particularly lower level injuries and incomplete injuries, can ambulate. Sometimes this is with assistive devices like crutches and AFOs, special types of braces, ankle foot orthoses, or other types of braces that come higher up that allow somebody with a lower level of injury to ambulate. But for the majority of people who sustain spinal cord injuries, dependent upon their level, they will either use a manual wheelchair or a power wheelchair to navigate their world. For people who use manual wheelchairs, they are able to get around in an accessible world very easily. Now we all know our world is not completely accessible and we don't have universal design. So unfortunately, our terrain and our lack of accessibility can be a big obstacle to people who use wheelchairs to get around on a daily basis. For a manual wheelchair user, they propel their chair just like anyone would who's using a chair with regular rims and allow them to get around and across a variety of different types of surfaces. However, curbs, rock, gravel, stairs are all going to be obstacles that are difficult. It doesn't mean that they can't be overcome, it just means difficult. So people with manual wheelchairs, particularly when we're doing diving trips, and if you're doing diving trips out of the country, will need some special accommodations to be able to allow them to get around as independently as possible. Oftentimes, if your only option is stairs to get someplace, someone in a manual wheelchair will need assistance from an able-bodied person to help pop up their wheelchair up those stairs or to help lift them up the stairs, depending upon the circumstances. Our goal, however, is to always try and find the most accessible places and to allow people to be as independent as possible. So problem solving is always important and encouraging the person who has the spinal cord injury to problem solve with you as to how to get around an obstacle is extremely important. For people who use power mobility, they're able to get around their environment by using a power wheelchair that they can use either a joystick mechanism, which they have some hand function to be able to propel, and or a sip and puff, which they use with their mouth, or a head array system. All of which are important to know that people need to be able to have accessible environments to get around. And if the environment that you're taking them to or the environment that you're in isn't accessible, you need to do some pre-planning and to make sure that you're able to do safe transfers in order to get people to where they need to go. With mobility, one of the things that's important, whether someone uses a power or a manual chair, is how they transfer. One of the things that you need to find out working with the person with the disability is are they independent with their transfers, meaning that they can move from one surface to another independently managing their own legs. For someone who's a paraplegic, this may be the case, but oftentimes people who are higher level quadriplegics will need some assistance in transfers. The most important thing is to talk to the individual with the disability and ask them what sort of assistance do they need to be able to transfer in different arenas. For example, on dive boats, someone who is able to independently transfer in other areas might not be able to independently transfer on a dive boat when they're going from one surface to another, higher or lower, and when there's waves involved and people moving around, it may be more difficult. So it's important to figure out how are you going to do transfers on the boat and how are you going to get on and off the boat. Sometimes people who are completely independent on land may need a little bit of additional assistance when you're using a dive boat talking to the individual with the disability about how this works for them, making sure that you understand what their needs are, and then making sure that you understand good transfer techniques. One of the things that's important to remember as a dive buddy is that you want to make sure when you're helping someone with a disability that you always ask them first about what their need is. And if you're transferring someone with their permission and helping them to do that, you also want to protect yourself. And that may sound a little bit strange, but the reality is, in doing transfers with people with disabilities, it is usually the able-bodied person doing the transfer who gets hurt. 
It's important to understand good body mechanics and to make sure that you're using good lifting techniques. This includes things like making sure you're bending your knees, being close to the object that you're transferring, so in this case, the person with the spinal cord injury, and making sure that you are going the shortest distance possible from one surface to the other when you're doing a transfer. After diving with people with disabilities for more than 10 years, we have a few tips that we can offer folks that may be helpful. One of the things is it's important to do some pre-planning. So if you're looking at doing a trip somewhere and you're going to be using a dive boat, you may want to ask questions about the accessibility of that boat, how people get on and off, is there a ramp available, and things like where's the bathroom located? Is it located on a level that people with the disabilities could get to and that they could do their catheterization if needed while they're out at the ocean? If not, it doesn't mean that it's not possible. What it means is, is you have to come up with some creative problem solving ideas. For example, we often use an all-in-one catheter program that allows you to catheterize anywhere and not have to catheterize into a toilet. There are a variety of other options that people will come up with and oftentimes do on their own out and about in the community since we all know communities aren't fully accessible. Another tip that's important to know is that when you're working with people who have spinal cord injuries in a pool, you want to make sure that they're fully covered with their wetsuit or some sort of lycra just to make sure that they're not scraping on the pool. They can scrape their feet on the bottom and end up with all sorts of problems that create cuts and wounds that would be much more problematic for them than for someone who is able-bodied. It's also important to know that people with spinal cord injuries, as well as people with spina bifida and healthcare workers, need to limit their exposure to latex. Latex is basically rubber, and the reason for that, at least as we know it now, is that oftentimes people with both spina bifida and spinal cord injuries are exposed to a lot of latex because of the types of procedures they have to have done and because of catheterization programs. There's a much higher risk of having an allergic reaction to latex if you have a spinal cord injury, spina bifida, or a healthcare worker. We therefore at our facility are latex free and do not use any latex products with our spina bifida patients, our spinal cord injury patients, or any of our healthcare folks. This is particularly important as you're looking at things that you use within the dive community, making sure that you understand what does and doesn't have latex. One of the other tips you might want to consider when working with people with spinal cord injuries or any types of disabilities when you're doing diving, particularly diving from a boat, is to do some pre-problem solving and think about things like which one of your kids or adults gets ready quickest, who overheats, who has issues with dysreflexia. Those are the kinds of things we often think about when we're working with the Dive Heart Foundation to make sure that we have a good understanding of who should go in the water first, what buddy groups are, and who should go in the water last. Doing some pre-planning like that really helps to make our trips go very smoothly and we're very happy at the end of those trips to find out that all of the kids have had a great experience because we've done that kind of pre-planning that makes it much easier for them. Another type of paralysis that you may hear of uh, besides paraplegia and quadriplegia or tetraplegia is hemiplegia. Hemi means half or one side of the body. This does happen in spinal cord injury where one side of the body is paralyzed, so one arm and one leg. You also see this in stroke and also in cases of cerebral palsy. Let's talk a little bit about psychological adjustment to disability. This is really dependent on whether somebody acquires a disability at some point during their life or is born with a disability or a disease state. Everyone's adjustment is different depending on their family, the supports they have, and what sort of disability they're struggling with. Oftentimes it's important to remember no matter who you're dealing with with a disability that they're a person first and their disability comes second. For people who have acquired spinal cord injuries or other acquired disabilities, they also are struggling with adjustment to that disability because it's something new and different to them. How big or how great that struggle is often depends on the age at the time that they were injured. It may depend on the level of disability impairment and on the types of supports and resources that they have within their family and their community. You'll hear when people talk about psychological disability and psychological adjustment that they often say things about grief and loss. And that's very true. Many times, particularly for acquired disabilities, people will go through different stages. The stages are very similar to those of grief and loss and stages that many of you have heard about that are often talked about in terms of death. Those stages have things to do with shock, denial, anger, adjustment or acceptance. However, those stages do not go in any sort of sequential order for every single person. People may have some stages that they are in and others that they completely skip. 
it's important to remember that psychological adjustment to disability is very individual. Another disability I'd like to talk a little bit about today is cerebral palsy, sometimes called CP. We at our facility see a lot of children who are born with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is somewhat of an umbrella term for a variety of different types of disability-related issues that occur for someone. Oftentimes, it occurs at birth from anaxia, which is lack of oxygen to the brain. Someone with cerebral palsy can have all sorts of different issues and a very, very broad range. Someone with very mild cerebral palsy may have such mild condition of the cerebral palsy that you would not even notice that this person has a disability. On the other end of the spectrum, people with cerebral palsy can have no voluntary movement, be very spastic or have uncontrollable muscle spasms, have no ability to swallow, to eat on their own, and cognitively be not much developed beyond an infant level. Cerebral palsy is a very wide-ranging disability. For some people, it means that they need assistance in walking. For some people, it may mean that they need assistance in communication and being able to talk, either by using a communication device or by getting speech therapy to help improve their communication. Many people with cerebral palsy have spasticity, which is involuntary control of their muscles. And this can make things like walking and activities of daily living, such as brushing your teeth, combing your hair, eating, very difficult. It's important when working with somebody with cerebral palsy that you understand their level of disability. Again, it can be very, very mild with hardly any, any limitating factors, or it can be something that's much more severe. It is also important to remember that the cognitive level of ability is not necessarily reflective of physical disability. Someone who has very severe cerebral palsy and does not have control of their body, has very spastic motion in their arms and legs, and may need to use a power wheelchair for mobility, may be developmentally appropriate, and have no other cognitive issues. Another disability we can talk about are people who have amputations. You can have both acquired amputations that are sustained at some point during your lifetime, and people who are born with amputations. At our facility, we see a large number of young children who have amputations and who do amazingly well in their activities of daily living. There are about 45,000 new amputations per year, and some of these are acquired from different traumatic accidents, some are from tumors, and again, there are also individuals who have birth amputations. For somebody with an amputation, adjustment to that disability is also very individual and very unique easier for a very young child to adjust to an amputation or having been born with the loss of one or two limbs than it is for someone who's an adult to adjust to an amputation. You'll hear terminology when talking about folks who are amputees such as BKA. Um, those sorts of things stand for below the knee amputation and that makes a difference for people in relationship to what sort of prosthetic device they use. Someone who has a below the knee amputation will use a different type of prosthetic device than someone who has an above the knee amputation. It also may change how they do some sports. For example, somebody who has an above the knee amputation on one side, if they were going to downhill ski, would ski on one ski. If it were a below the knee amputation, they'd be able to use their prosthesis and ski on two. For scuba diving, whether you have an above or a below the knee amputation doesn't require any different sort of adaptations. You'll also hear above and below the elbow when we're talking about amputations of the upper extremities. Same situation here in relationship to prosthesis and how those prostheses are used. Again, it doesn't matter in the sport of scuba diving for special adaptations, whether someone is above or below the elbow amputee. One of the things we talk about often in the rehabilitation world is the importance of using correct terminology when talking about people with disabilities. We always want to per put the person first and the disability second. However, I think oftentimes when we're talking about amputations, one of the things that surprises people is they'll hear the terminology stump. Stump means the part of the leg or the part of the arm that is still present on the body um, after an amputation has occurred. This terminology is actually correct and can be used, and most people with amputations refer to the remaining part of their limb as a stump. 